There's something wildly engrossing about Genndy Tartakovsky's newest show, Primal. And I think it stems entirely from the fact that its five episodes so far don't feature a single word of dialogue. If you hang around movie blogs and film journals long enough, you're liable to run into some form of the idea that Hitchcock dubbed pure cinema. This idea that, at its purest, film is the realm of visual storytelling. What separates it from every other artistic medium is that indescribably magical combination of movement, rhythm, and the interaction between images to create a new kind of language that doesn't require a single word to work. This is why some argue that silent film is still the height of the art form, as its makers were constantly pushing the medium to operate in ways that no other could. Tartakovsky's no stranger to this type of storytelling. Primal, of course, isn't a silent film, but it has the sensibilities of one. It's a show obsessed with movement and rhythm more than anything else, and is very much an extension of the work he's done with Samurai Jack and his Clone Wars micro-series, having the confidence to strip away dialogue and let his images guide. In fact, dialogue-free sequences like these are probably one of the most defining and attractive factors of all of his work. You could even make the argument that the show's title is a double meaning in and of itself. Yes, it's a pulpy, odd couple-style story about a caveman and a T-Rex surviving in a bloody and brutal prehistoric world, but the way that Tartakovsky structures each story is like going back to the very fundamentals of visual storytelling. The series' fourth episode, the delightfully titled Terror Under the Blood Moon, can be boiled down to a story of directions. Act 1 opens on our caveman T-Rex duo fleeing from a pursuing group of velociraptors, the further they run to the right, the more dangerous their situation becomes. Act 2, they hit a stopping point and battle a giant spider right out of Lord of the Rings. And in Act 3, they turn around and run right back the way that they came. It's a simple and effective piece of action storytelling, not entirely unlike Mad Max Fury Road, which basically boasted the exact same story structure. Run in this direction, stop, turn around, and run back the way you came. Interestingly enough, when George Miller made Fury Road, he echoed Hitchcock's sentiment about pure cinema, vocal about how, in his words, he wanted to make a film that could be understood in Japan without subtitles. Pure visual storytelling often requires and stresses that kind of structural simplicity to create a story that can be rendered universal. The wider story of Primal's five episodes thus far is about survival, but the individual moments that each story is made up of are approached from a kind of functional standpoint. Episodes are made up of simple story beats. Escape the giant crocodile coming to eat you. Escape the pterodactyl also trying to eat you. Figure out how to climb up the side of a cliff. And figure out how to get back down that cliff without falling to your death. None of them necessarily thematically compelling on the page, but all intrinsically visual and rooted in the actions each of the show's characters take. The show's second episode, River of Snakes, is a great example of simple functional story beats combined with a kind of directional structure.
It starts with both characters pursuing the same kill, but only for themselves. They're a team, yes, but a new and uncomfortable one, like awkward roommates who steal each other's food and don't apologize for it. The story continues as tension between them rises and rises and ends up giving way to a skirmish. but culminates as they have to put aside frustrations to work together to overcome a common enemy. Within that, there's a kind of directional structure. The two characters are separately after the same goal, they're opposed to one another, and then together in the end. It's a story of rising antagonism that dissipates into friendship. But to talk about Primal as only a visual marvel is to only look at half the picture. The show's sound design by veteran engineer Joel Valentine is an auditory spectacle of the highest degree. And it isn't just the effectively horrific squishing and crunching he layers in. but it's the way that his sound design helps create a nuance within the edit of each episode. There's a wonderful sense of both texture and patience in the build of each mix. It's a Tartakovsky staple to hold almost uncomfortably long on moments of near silence, only to upset them by bursts of action and violence. If you wanted, you could probably label Tartakovsky the Sergio Leone of animation, drawing moments like these out longer than anyone else would. The series' fifth and most recent episode, Rage of the Eight Men, spends the first nine out of its 22-minute runtime with the two characters just simply relaxing at an oasis they stumble upon. The opening serving not only as a rest from all that they've been through thus far, but as a kind of preparation for the horror of what comes in the story's latter 13 minutes. There's a creeping sense of dread through the heart of these minutes. It's that feeling that you need to keep looking over your shoulder because something just doesn't feel right. Shots are drawn out and the mix is minimal, both serving to draw the viewer in. It's honestly one of the best examples of edge of your seat filmmaking that I can think of from the last couple of years. And when the horror of those last 13 minutes comes, boy does it ever. All of this combined together creates one of the most unique animated experiences of the past few years, and what I may just argue is Tartakovsky's most accomplished work yet. It's not only an incredible case study in visual storytelling, but it's exemplar of the kind of adult-geared animation I've been begging for for years. And if none of that's compelling enough, then God willing, the sight of a caveman riding atop a T-Rex should instill within you the, the giddiest, pulpy delight. And if it doesn't, well, then I'm not sure what will. Thank you guys so much for watching. This episode is brought to you by Audible. So if you're interested in that Hitchcockian idea of pure cinema that I talked about in this video, I'd highly, highly recommend Paul Auster's novel, The Book of Illusions. It's the story of a writer investigating the disappearance of a long-lost silent filmmaker in the earth-shattering films that he made. It's absolutely engrossing and definitely one of my favorites that I've read in recent years. You can find that and so much more on Audible. Members get to pick three free titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. 
And if for whatever reason you don't like the audiobook you picked, you can exchange it free of charge, no questions asked. And best of all, your audiobooks are yours forever, even if you cancel. You can start listening today with a 30-day trial and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals completely free. Go to audible.com slash royaloceanfilm or text royaloceanfilm to 500-500 to sign up today.